Welcome everyone uh, to the Office of Business Diversity and Compliance webinar at Boost Your Business, How to Increase Your, your Profits and Gain Customers. Uh, I'm Taylor Tagg, a Senior Business Services Coordinator with the City of Memphis and the Office of Business Diversity and Compliance. Of course, we're thrilled that you're here today to uh, attend our webinar. Of course, we're, we've got a series of webinars going on uh, throughout the next several months on getting your business ready and getting back from the COVID-19 response which has been a challenge for, for many of us. But these webinars will give us kind of an idea of how to, how to get our business going again and hopefully increase it exponentially. And so this month we're going to be focusing on finances and increasing your revenue. And to start off our webinar, our webinar for this month, I brought in an expert, uh, David Nanny. And David is a wealth of experience. He has been in business for many years, both as an employee and a business owner. He worked for Pfizer and FedEx and AutoZone in corporate America, and then for the last nine years has been a small business owner and CPA. So David's got a tremendous wealth of knowledge, and that's one of the reasons why we brought him in here today. And just so that you know, beyond this webinar you're going to be shared with today, if you need additional help with any aspect of your business, that it, it's not where it needs to be. Of course, you can call the OPC Navigators at 901-636-9300. We'll be happy to assist you, you're free of charge, to get you kind of where you want to be. And so I'd like to share with you also, we've got a couple of webinars upcoming. We've got one next Wednesday on restarting your financial aspect of your business. And of course, on June 23rd is our annual uh, business symposium which will be online and all virtual this year. So be sure to sign up for those two. So I want to go ahead and bring David online here and, and uh, get it going. And so he'll talk about how to increase your revenues and gain, yeah, gain your customer base today. David, thanks for joining us today. Well, thank you. Um, just wanted to, uh, Taylor, good job introducing me. I just want to let you guys know we've got several slides to go through and we should be able to get through them all. I'm going to try to leave us a good amount of time at the back end for questions and answers because there's going to be a lot of things said today that uh, some of which may be what you consider common sense, but uh, we'll talk about that, how that's uh, not necessarily always the case. But then also, um, I want you. I always like to hear what's really going on out there on the street, so to speak, with business owners, because you guys are closest to uh, reality more so than what you get through the news and things. So it's always good to hear from actual business owners what's happening out there. And uh, so if you have some examples of things I might bring up and you have questions about them specifically, I always welcome those. But I'm going to try to hold those off the end or otherwise we can spin out of control. So I just wanted to. Um, you know, Taylor did a good job introducing me. I am a CPA. I help out a lot of small businesses and individuals. Um, the first thing is, right now, as you know, we've we had a lot of adversity from every different angle you could possibly imagine. We already had uh, every day. Everybody has their day to day issues that come up with competition and trying to just survive in normal circumstances. Then on top of that, we have the uh, um, all the effects of what's happened with uh, the virus and everything that's gone on there. And so we're going to kind of focus the, the discussion on dealing with some of the adversity, um, what it's made you aware of about your business, because hopefully some things came to light that when unexpected things happen, sometimes is when you figure out you've got uh, an advantage or a weakness. And then how do we use that awareness going forward to provide some uh, uh, advantages for you to help you maintain your business. If you made it to this point, you're probably not doing uh, too badly because a lot of people, you know, weren't able to stay in business after the first month or so. So there's some, there's, if you're still out here in June and you're still in business, you, you probably uh, survived the worst of it, I hope, since we're easing back in to getting things going. But um, and we'll talk a little bit on about where you are right now. And also, I'm going to give some examples throughout to show you what it is I'm seeing out there.
David, you may want to un unmute yourself. I think you're muted. Sorry, I just switched the slide. Evidently, it unmuted me. I apologize. So let me start over. So there's a lot of events beyond your control. I mentioned the fact that Nashville had a tornado right before the COVID-19 hit, so they had a double whammy. I know Mississippi's had some issues with weather as well, but there's all these business interruption things that can happen. And I want you to understand these, these two bullet points here about loss of customers and loss of suppliers. Your business is a system. It's not just, hey, I lost customers. I also, you, you may have issues on, I've got plenty of customers. I just can't get my supply to them, whether it be a product or service. I can't get out there to, um, I can't find the things I need to, to serve my customers. So it can, ha it's, it's a, on both ends of the spectrum, you have to worry about and make sure you got it covered. And then the other thing was the government intercession, a lot of things unforeseen. Uh, there was some choosing of who should be staying open, who shouldn't be. You had no control over that. So there's some creativity that had to kind of take place with, with people. And we'll talk about that a little bit. And then, over the years, like Taylor mentioned, I worked in uh, large corporations for a long time. There are always these business continuity plans. What do we do if this happens, if that happens? Uh, do we work remotely, which a lot of people are doing? And that's a good plan to have, but this has been um, a much more uh, striking uh, moment in history to not just business continuity from, hey, I lost power or we had an earthquake or something. This is much bigger on, I lost the ability to do my work. So we're going to talk about that a little bit as well. And one thing is um, a lot of things say we're all in this together and this sort of thing. You're not alone out there. But how do you what are you learning? Are you taking the time right now to get out there and find out how other people in your business area, your realm, your uh, whatever it is you do, how are they making it? What ideas are you getting? And then did the finally, did you take advantage of all the government help? And the re reason I put that in quotes is a little bit humorous, trying to put a little levity into it, is that um, I know I am well aware of all these programs out there, and Taylor and I were talking about it before we started, where you had the PPP loan, and there was an emergency grant loan, and there's the EIDL loan, and the city of Memphis has a loan now, the state of Tennessee's got some loan. But the rules were changing, the bars were getting uh, moved up and down, the goalposts were getting moved, however you want to say it, and it, it just got to be quite overwhelming. Um, but but the point is you need to still, we know it's frustrating and we know it's, it's something you had to plow through, but it really did help a lot of companies that were able to gain those funds, and but it required a lot of patience and a lot of... Uh, uh, work on the business owner's end because they had to provide a lot of information that they weren't used to having to provide. So we'll talk about that a little bit as well. But adversity is always out there. And like I said before, I commend you guys, if you're still in business after everything we've been through the last couple of months, you have done a great job because this is nothing like this has ever happened before in my lifetime for sure. So let me get back over here. One, something I really want to talk about, we all know about the adversity, I really want to focus on this section, a lot of it, the awareness part, because you got a guy looking in a mirror here. A lot of us had to do some real self-evaluation, looking at your business throughout the PPP process, for instance. I, as a CPA, I work with the business owners and my business owners work with their banker. I was have been a little shocked at how little those two entities know each other. Um, we do a lot of things now um, online. You go to the ATM, make your deposit. Most of them, a lot of people don't even go to the ATM anymore. They just take a picture of their deposit and put it in the bank, or they do all their bill paying online. So they don't really have an, an old school banker. They don't know someone. So I would ask them, who are you working with there? I don't know, some guy I sent my stuff into. And on the other side of it, I was asking, the bankers ended up calling me, and I would say, well, you know, what do you know about their business? And they're asking me all these questions that didn't make any sense with the business, and a lot of those kind of get into the weeds about different tax forms and things. But I was like, they don't file that tax form. No business of their type would. I was just a little surprised at how little communication or knowledge there was after we had over the last 20 years all these Patriot Act and know your customer laws and all these things that the banks have put in place, it really made me focus on, we've got to raise some awareness internally in the companies about, um, you know, 
do, do, my, do the stakeholders in my business or my partners in my business, do they know about my business? And I know that sounds ridiculous, but it, it was quite apparent that there were a lot of disconnects um, between different stakeholders and the bank was one of them. The other thing was that we saw a lot of, and this goes back to my previous comment about your business being a system, is there things, something in the accounting world we call concentration risk. So if you are, um, if you're doing business and let's say, you know, 40, 50 percent of your business is with um, pick an easy example. You supply FedEx some kind of service. You you uh, provide some kind of service to businesses, but they're your main customer to the tune of half your business. Well, if they had problems, you had problems. And there's some risk there that when the times are good, nobody you know, thinks about that. But when times are bad, that hit there is really large. And we're going to talk a little bit later about ways to mitigate that and not have that situation because uh, it, it wasn't really one of those things people focus on a lot. But it doesn't matter even if you're talking about, you know, I just use that example for FedEx, or even if anybody out there where you have a niche business or you have a business where a large percentage of your business is wound up either with one customer or on the flip side of that you're extremely dependent upon one supplier if they had a problem you had a problem and it was a real uh, eye-opening experience for several businesses out there the other one is um your employees one thing that hit several people was the, the fact that they ramped up unemployment benefits i had a couple clients that had that issue um where people was it was actually better for them to not work in the short term because they were going to get more money. Well, that um, was really short-sighted because the benefits ran out in July and then they essentially came back and changed some rules on that. So it was turbulent, but also it was uh, it was an eye-opening experience. You need to become aware, really be paying attention. The other point was financial stability. And we're gonna talk about that some more too, obviously. But the point was people, a lot of times um, in small business, and I'm guilty of it as well, so I'm pointing the finger back at me. You look at what's in the bank, and then are all my bills paid, and am I showing a profit? Well, that's great, but on their financial statements, there's lots of other line items and lots of other accounts, and they need to be paid attention to. And so there are things where, yeah, I have a lot of sales, but I have, I'm carrying a lot of receivables or people haven't paid me yet. Well, when this thing hit, your odds of getting paid went down quite a bit. So how stable were you? Just because you showed these sales and this profit, this one event, which was a major event, I'm not taking anything away from it, it's a nuclear bomb event, but it, it really impacted uh, things were going along smoothly as far as you knew because you never had any kind of problem. But now here's this major hit. And so you really weren't that stable. It was sort of a, uh, it was all kind of hidden by the fact that, you know, you, you live in sort of in a cash flow world. We get money in and get money out, but any interruption was going to cause major havoc. And so we got to, we have to really look at your financials more often, know what's going on with the business and see just how stable am I or how far away am I from another collapse. Consultants will always tell you, what are the lessons learned? That's a neat phrase. It sounds good. But there will be another event that comes up down the road. We sit here. On, you've been hearing this for 30 years about we sit here on the, the New Madrid Fault, for instance. So it could be an earthquake or it could be another major recession or it could be what it could be whatever. But are you really having lessons learned or are you just having stuff that happened that we hope doesn't happen again? And that's where you really if you're going to call it lessons learned, that implies that there's going to be some action done to mitigate against that happening again. And one of the things that needs to, that I hope everybody takes out of this, um, and, and I may be, you know, may not be talking directly to anybody on the call, but hopefully um, over time you can see that this opportunity, what did I learn? This is the time to, to take those lessons and get more concrete relationships with all those stakeholders we just talked about. Uh, bankers, customers, suppliers, even your employees, shareholders, partners, whatever. Is everybody really going the same direction? Because we keep hearing about how we're all in this together, but that may not always be the case. So you want to make sure coming out of this, hey, I learned that we had some real gaps there. Going forward, we got to really get on this and make sure uh, 
we really have solid relationships going forward. Now, the good part, um, I want everybody to understand that you have to now turn all that awareness into, okay, how do I, I'm still in business, or maybe I'm just now going into business coming out of this uh, thing we just had because perhaps I lost my job and now I got to go find a way to make some money. So I'm going to start a business. And either way, what use the lessons you learn to your advantage going forward. If you didn't have, if those lessons aren't positive, that's okay. You're not the only one that didn't have positive experiences. I'm, I mean, there's there's all kinds of, of bad things that happen out there to people, but that's okay. At least we learned something about it. So just a couple of examples. And there, this page could be 40 or 50 bullet points long, but we only have an hour. So one thing is debt. Debt, you've been hearing about this. You ever listen to Dave Ramsey? If you listen to people, debt's a bad thing. You hear that all the time. It's not necessarily, but one point that I want you to take out of it is if you didn't have any, the loss of income wasn't so bad because you didn't have any bills to have to pay. Now, we all have everyday bills, but I'm talking about notes, loans, those type of things, mortgages, um, that debt can be crushing when it's piled on top of normal day-to-day -day activity and we've turned the spigot off for the income part. <clears throat> so, how are you planning for all these things that have happened going forward? Looking ahead, hopefully, like I said, the worst is behind us. Going forward, what are you doing? And we'll hopefully get some examples down the back end. Um, I have some out there. I, I was talking to one of my clients this morning. Um, We'll talk about it. Your customers, your customers out there are, um, and we and we got several slides here. Customers, technology, networking, and cost savings. So I'm going to go on over to the customers. Now you need to be strengthening relationships with them. I had an example this morning, like I was saying, a company, a company I have here in Memphis as a client. It's a large HVAC company, heating, ventilation, air conditioning, and they also do plumbing. Well, even though they have ads on TV, even though their trucks all say. HVAC and plumbing, even though um, they're all over the place at different media, there are still people that say, that's my HVAC company. Okay. But they also do plumbing. So one of the first things they did when this hit was they had a couple of their people get on the phone and literally just sat there on the phone and called, cold called their, their HVAC customers and let them know, hey, we do plumbing. And they got over 100 sales out of that. Well, and everybody says, well, that's common sense. You think it would be, but there are people that are like, hey, this guy mows my yard and I have another, but now my, my gutter guy is out of business. Gee, who in the world do I call? Well, maybe the yard mowing guy cleans the gutters. You don't know, but that's what, as you, you're in business, you've got to make your customers aware of all the services and products you provide. You cannot assume that they know all the things you provide because they've only contracted you to do one thing. Or they may just come by one thing from you, one product from you. They don't, they may not know about the other 700 products you have or the other services you provide. And coming from your side of the table, you think, why do they not know that? I don't know. I don't have the answer on that. But people are wired certain ways. And when they, when they Google who does, um, you know, uh, you know, who does, HVAC work in Memphis, they're going to zero in just on that. They don't read all the stuff that they do besides that because at that day, they're just looking for somebody to fix their air conditioning. So you need to strengthen relationships with your customers and let them know what it is you need um, from a number of standpoints. One is what issues do they have in their business? Um, also, do they have payment problems? Because when all this happened, they may be a great customer, but I, a great customer is someone who, who actually pays you. So just because somebody buys stuff from you or takes your service and they end up being a slow pay customer, um, that's not necessarily a great customer. And in times like these, you have to understand what's going on with their place. Now, I know this all takes time. It's easy to say. It's harder to do. I know that. But especially your big ones, you have to know, are they solid? Are they stable? Because if they have problems, I have problems. Now, the good news is they are you've, you've probably already built up a level of trust. Um, letting someone 
letting one of your people into their home, say you clean houses or whatever it is, letting someone into your home or, or someone who's buying something from you that's a, a product they need, there's already a certain level of trust there depending upon uh, how long they've been with you as well. But sometimes these people, it's an easy sell if you have other products or services. And uh, like I said, you, you would think that would be uh, something where everybody thinks about, but it's not always the case. Do they need something complimentary? Do you have, do you, you may have to flip that around and say, hey, I'm out here doing X for this person. They have a need because their other service guy just went out of business. He wasn't able to survive this. Well, there's work laying there. Somebody's got to do it. Um, you may need to expand your product line or service line. Um, perhaps you say, well, I just, I don't really want to go down into Olive Branch. I'm going to stay right here in Memphis. Well, if your competitor in Olive Branch just went out of business, you just gonna let somebody else get that, or or can you, you know, go get your Mississippi license and go through all the the trouble of having to deal with that? Yes, but is it worth it to go across state line or go say I, I just kind of like serving my neighborhood? You might need to go out to Fayette County. You might need to go out to Tennessee. You might need to go expand your your markets, that type of thing. And an easy way too is sometimes just ask your customer. You don't have to do the real. You don't have to do the hard sell. Do you know 10 people? Make them fill out a thing. Everybody hates doing those. But but who do your customers know? You If you have a certain group of customers that trust you, that you talk to often, let them know. Say, hey, do you know anybody else needing my stuff? That, those are very low-hanging fruit, easy additional sales to pick up. Uh, I see a lot in my business because if I'm doing – you know, if I'm doing Taylor tax tax return and then I say, he says, well, how about you do my dad's because his, his guy just retired or, you know, then later on, Taylor's got a buddy or a cousin or whoever. It, it can easily expand it. I know it's not so easy in other places, but um, if, you, if you're doing a good job in uh, in one spot, so you, you know, I like using Long Morning's example because I used to do it when I was young. And it's easy for everybody to get. So if I'm doing one person's house and I look around the neighborhood and see five yards that look horrible, um, there's probably an opportunity there to, to pick up one, but uh, you, you can ask the homeowner, say, hey, you know what's going on around these houses? You know, something just, it's not that, it's, it's not, you're not having to really get a cold sell there. Some, you kind of, they already know someone that might be able to refer you and help you out. It should be a little bit easier to break into those new customers. And you got to be thinking that way constantly. The second one was one that really became paramount during this last couple of months of the technology usage. And once again, you would think this is uh, common sense, but um, a lot of people, they say, hey, I use e-commerce. And you talk to them about it and they have PayPal that they're accepting payments through. I'm like, OK, they have a website. Well, that's that's the bar is pretty low there because um, I, I have a website and I accept PayPal. But then it's. Um, are you really using it to market? Are you um, contacting your customers like the third book one, like we're doing now? Are you contacting people who say, well, they, they can't come out here. I usually go out there and talk to them. Well, it's a great opportunity to get to them with the Zoom or go to me and they say, well, they don't know how to do that. That's an even better opportunity to sit there and you can actually help them understand how to do something which shows that you care more about them than just getting their check in the mail. So you could actually, you know, uh, use those type of things. But also it, the main part of it is it broadens your market, obviously, which you all know that I'm not, you know, you're not, you're all aware of that. that, that the internet broadens your market, which is obvious, but then there are so many things you can do with social media and I'm not, most savvy of all these people, but you can niche market to groups. There are things you can do out on the different social media sites to say, I only want to hit these people that, you know, all these demographic information is out there about re where they live and all the age group and all these things. And you can drop that in and, and direct your marketing at people. And um, it's just a way for you to leverage, especially if you're a small business, one or two or three people to reach a great number of people um, beyond what you already were. And so I have some clients who are very small businesses, but they're, you know, extremely small, two and three people, but they're taking sales orders from all over the country and they're very, they're quite successful with it. And you have to do that because in these times, the brick and mortar, we've been hearing about this for years, but, you know, the whole shift over to e-commerce, but it was such a compliment, a nice complimentary thing 
when you shift it to, hey, people can drive up and get something in their car, or they're, they're all going to be working at home, they can just order it and have it delivered to them. Um, if you didn't have that second part of that piece, you missed out on a lot of sales. And if your competition did have, they took them from you in all likelihood. So that's where it's very important. If you never have embraced it before, take the learning away from this to, to you know, if you have to, in my case, I get my 21 year old son to figure it out for me. Um, but, you know, whatever you have to do, some of you, are, I'm sure, are much more savvy than I am on it. But do what you have to do to expand that base and get more customers and uh, along those lines um it's still possible to network there's been a lot of webinars there have been a lot of uh, you know go to meeting type things social media again there are now we're getting back into people you know people are out back out now but you can still do things like like this if i say hey if i wanted to have lunch with one of you guys i say hey i don't have to sit here with you if you're not comfortable getting out i can order you something and have a zoom meeting with you at least we can still talk and have it's not quite as intimate but we can still you know speak um one thing too is your, your marketing the second bullet point here it is very it is very cheap to join uh certain groups that have forums out there on various social media to talk about things, uh, create a podcast, create a blog. Nobody cares what I have to say, uh, that type of thing. So everybody gets in their head and says, well, nobody cares. I don't want to do that. Look, there's there's 300 million people out there. You only have to get a very small percentage for somebody to care about what you have to say. So the reason for that is I say that. I don't know what all of you do. Hopefully we'll learn that here in a minute. But um, becoming... If people see you as an expert on a subject, I don't care if it's laying tile or if it's, uh, you know, putting on roofs or doing accounting. If they see you as an expert in that topic, they will seek you out at some point. It may take another year or two, but they will seek you out. But you got to start planting those seeds. And if you're if you're out there as the person that people say, hey, you know, um, I remember that guy had a blog or he had, a, he had this guy's a podcast. He's always talking about, you know auto mechanics and all the things associated with, with fixing the car. I'm going to call that guy because he's um, he always has a number at the end of it where he tells you to call. It's just an easy way. It's not expensive. It's a very easy way. The last one is very simple, I extremely simple, but people sometimes take it for granted once again that um, everybody knows what I do. Everybody knows who I am. No, they don't. If you're like me, I'm 50 years old, or I will be in August. I'm hanging on to 49 as long as I can. But you're, my sphere, to be honest and, and self-aware, my sphere is pretty much people 10 years above me, 10 years beyond me, because it's the people who I came to, when I came to work with them, they were 10 years older than me, and they were my boss, or there are people around my age I went to high school, college with, whatever, and then people a few years younger than me that I kind of knew their brother or sister, and they're you know, younger, that type of thing. That's limiting. You're limiting your market. You still have to get you have to get a little bit uncomfortable sometimes and say, okay, um, my son now 21 is going to graduate college next year. His friends are going to start making money. They're going to have some needs for my services at some point. I need to reach out to them somehow. Well, uh, I've also now got a situation where I may do tax returns for somebody's kids now. And I have to figure out what it is they're thinking, what they're needing, how can I get them to expand that sphere? Use all of your contacts, parents, grandparents, any clubs you're in, uh, churches that you go to, any uh, any old customers that you may have lost because sometimes and anybody says, I'm not gonna call them back. Well, sometimes it's, it's good to say, okay, I lost this customer. So now I'm number two on their list, maybe worse. But you don't know what's going on. A year has passed, two years have passed. If you're in survival mode right now, you need to reach out to them. Worst, worst thing they can do is hang the phone up on you and not answer the call. Reach back out to some people you may have lost, or maybe they grew bigger and outgrew your service and had to go somewhere else. Times have changed. So maybe it may be time to reach back out to them. I'm just saying, and I'm not saying this is absolutely the case. You all know your business is better than I do. But you got to be creative and you got to take away some of the mindset of, well, I've never done that before. Okay. Well, now's the time to do it because it's, um, you need to get your sales back up to be profitable again. So that's, uh, it's, it's time to get out of the comfort zone. This is a cliche. I know you've heard that a million times, but you've got to 
get out of that a little bit and expand those fears of, of people and the groups that you're in. Maybe, um, you know, you'd be surprised too. A lot of people, when you do that, they'll say, well, I always knew you were, um, so my son's name's Christopher. My name's David. Um, my name's David to all my people that know me. To everybody else, I'm Christopher's dad. They have no idea what I do. They don't even know my name. But when you get out there and start talking to them, they say, oh, well, I knew you. I've seen you around for years, all the way through, you know, the kids going to high school together, but I never knew what you did. That's a shame on me. I should have told them. Now, you don't want to be that guy who's always handing out business cards. Everybody hates to see you coming, but you need to be the person that they need to know what it is you do because you could have a million dollar client sitting right there that you didn't know anything about because you never have taken the time to introduce yourself and what it is you do. So it, I, I'm just saying, I, I hope that makes sense, but it's just, you have to be open to tell people what it is you do and what service you provide, what products you provide, and and you never know what can happen out of that. Okay. One thing I want to touch on, too, we're talking about profitability. We have plenty of time here, which is good. One thing on the profitability of a company that has to happen right now, should happen all the time, but it's, most people don't pay attention to profitability until something bad like this happens. Um, look down through your, your financials and say, okay, what, who all am I doing business with? Um, one thing I would, if, if somebody tells me about this, I'll tell them, no, I didn't, I didn't tell you to do this, but you, it's, I don't want you to be J.R. Ewing here and be, you know, just a snake, but you can also be, use a little bit of leverage. Your suppliers right now need your cash too. So you need to talk to them. There've been a lot of talk about people suspending mortgages, suspending MLGW, suspending cutoffs, that sort of thing. And that's at a high level and that's what makes the news. But you can also go out there to your suppliers and say, look, I'm hurting right now and I need product A or whatever it is. I need this from you, but I cannot pay you 100%. I, I, I can only pay you 75 right now and I'll pay the 25 back on the back end. We'll defer it somehow. If they're a savvy business person, they're probably going through the same thing you're going through right now. They're going to at least listen and say, okay, what can we work out? Because some cash, you know, half a loaf of bread is better than no bread. So some cash is better than no cash. So they, you may be able to, to negotiate some things, especially if you're someone who is good about paying on time and always has, you've hopefully built up some, uh, not necessarily credit, but you've built up some uh, capital with them as far as, you know, I've been with you for five years and always paid you on time. Now's the time. And you cut me a little bit of a break. Now they're going to be they're going to be bombarded with people like that, so expect a little bit of pushback. But just try to say, I, I want to be fair to you. We all got to eat, but what you know, what can we do here to make some things change? Can I put this bill off till next month? And uh, that that sort of thing. Um, I'm not saying to go out there and just be, you know, not a good customer. But on the flip side of this too is you can do that to your actual customers and say, listen, I know you owe me a hundred dollars. I'll take 90 if I can get it tomorrow because you need cash. Cash is lifeblood of the business. If you don't have it, you won't be a business very long. So you have to do what you have to do right now to survive. And one of the things may be both sides of this equation, work on ways to get more money in and work on ways to get less money going out. Another thing is look at your income statement. Um, closely and, and delve into some of the accounts. One thing uh, I suggest a lot of people do, because it's, it's pretty easy to do right now, is limit travel costs. If your travel costs are $1,000 a month for your job or your, your uh, work, your company, they should be lower right now. I, mean, I don't know where it is you're going, but um, a lot of people aren't going anywhere. But also, there's going to be some great deals on office space coming up because people are realizing they don't have to have all the space they're in. They can work from home. So there's going to be a, maybe a deal there. You might be able to downsize, but those are long-term, shorter term. One thing I use here as an example, um, every time I go, not every time, but a lot of times I go out to clients, you look at things like do the subscriptions or miscellaneous expense, these type of accounts where people have stuff in and you look at it and go, what are y'all doing? You've got like iTunes, Spotify, Wall Street Journal, all these things you signed up for your free trial and then you wind up spending a hundred bucks a month on them. And 
I mean, I, it's funny, but it's not funny because it's you'd be surprised how many places have that where I mean, some of them it's a lot of money, but you're like, what are all what are all these things you're paying for that you're not even using? Um, a second expense of some kind where you really only need one. All these type of things they're out there, and so it's something I think. Um, I don't know if it hits close to home to anybody, but you look through your entire profit and loss segment and look at the expenses and say, do I really need these? Or is this just something I, it was a nice to have? Uh, can I cancel this? You need to try to do that because most people understand raising sales. That's not easy, but they understand that concept. When you get into cutting expenses is when everybody has their baby that they don't want to get rid of. So, but look at the profit and loss statement and see the income statement. Look at it and see, is there, are there places in here where I can cut out 200, 300 a month? Whatever the number is, every little bit helps, especially right now. And uh, I don't know if that's something you guys have already done. A lot of people already have, but it, it, it can really add up quickly. So now you're still in business. I hope we wouldn't be out here otherwise. What what did you do? What were some things I want to hear on the back end when we get a QA is some things you guys have had to experience, some things you guys had to do uh, creative creatively, creatively to stay in business. Uh, what have you learned? How have you used those learnings? And what are you what are you going to do for the next adverse condition? Going back to what we talked about earlier, um, you have to get back a little bit to the old school. I know a lot of people like doing things online and all this sort of thing, and that's great to embrace that technology, but you need to know your customers, know your suppliers, know what's going on. Uh, it's not, it'd be nice if your banker knew your business a little bit to, because when you go to need a loan, if they've never heard of you, never seen you, they just know your number on paper, it's not gonna be quite as easy. Um, even if it is easy, some of these PPP loans, for instance, the situations where my clients actually knew their bankers and the bankers knew what they looked like because they've been in the building before and had talked to each other, their loans sailed through a lot faster than loans where people, I don't know who this person is, so I've got to learn a little bit about them first. Then I got to learn what kind of tax return do they file? Okay, well, do they have payroll? All right, well, that drug out for two weeks. In the meantime, my expenses never stop. My expenses are 24 seven. You, you pay for your rent for all 24 hours of the day. You may only use it eight hours a day. You pay for it all 24 hours though. So it's a thing where the expenses were nonstop and I was dragging, you know, people are dragging their feet to get their loan because all these things they had to find out about each other. I'm like, they had an account with you for five years, but it's all been all the online stuff. So then another point is one advantage is, are you out there, if you're out there aware of what's going on around you, do you know there are customers out there needing your product or service because your competition has gone out of business? Are you out there aggressively seeking that business? Are you letting people know we're open? You drive around town, you see all these restaurants with big signs they stuck up, you know, we're, we are open, we dine in as well, or we are doing this. They've all got their signs that we're open. You need to be putting that, if you have to do it physically, do that. Put it on social media, put it wherever. Let everybody know you're open. Because once again, you cannot assume, oh, well, they should have seen on the news we're reopening. They don't know that. There's still places out there that aren't. And you need to let people know, yes, even though the four people in our shopping center aren't open, we're the one out of five that is. You need to let them know that. If you're doing a service business, you need to tell them, yes, we're still coming. We still plan on coming out there. If you don't want us to, you need to let us know, but we're still coming to do whatever it is we do. Clean your house, mow your yard, paint your house, whatever. We're coming. We're still in business. And another, the other aspect of that is the people who did go out of business, if you know there's a fantastic employee over there that they had to let go, man, now it is, it is a time. There are people out there looking for work, and some of them are great. And now's the time you can get really good people you've been looking for for a long time uh, because they may not have a job. So you have to be aggressive about it. I know it's a lot to manage, but it, it's some of these things are opportunities. Yes, there's a terrible aspect to it. But there's also an opportunity on the back end for you to get an advantage out of it. 
Okay, that was kind of fast, but um, anybody have, I'd like to talk to people, so what's going on out there. Anybody got any questions or anything uh, they'd like to add? Yeah, David, we'll, uh, we do have one question to chat. We'll get to that first, and then after that, anybody that would like to unmute and talk with David directly, you're, you're welcome to do that. Uh, Laura did have a question in the chat uh, about how often do you suggest reaching out to past customers uh, she doesn't want to be a pest, but doesn't want to stay in touch. So what, what's your take on that? Well, it depends on what the business is, but I, I mean, I would say um, I would do it right now just because of the way the situation is. Um, but then going forward, I mean, it doesn't have to be a big deal once a year, twice a year or something. I don't know what business she's in, but that's the thing where you might, uh, you, I understand her point. You don't want to be, Good Lord, Laura's calling again. I know that you don't want that to happen, but um, it's been, I would definitely do it right now just because of where we're at. And then come out, you know, after that, say, okay, well, I'm going to check. You just end the phone call. Whatever, how are you dealing with them now? Say, hey, don't want to pass you, but I'll check back with you in about a year or next year. Make sure everything's going okay. Or I'll check back with you in six months, whatever. You know your customers better than I do, but I obviously don't call them every week. My God. But you know, a certain amount of time out, but I would definitely do it now because now is when there's a lot of things that are getting shaken out and some customers are falling through and need somebody to pick them up. And then on the back end, uh, I would, after you talk to them, I'd say, well, I'm going to check back with you in so many months, whatever that is for your business. Um, I'll, I know I didn't give you the exact black and white answer there, but I hope that's a um, good enough answer. It is well. If you just want to unmute yourself and ask David a question, go right ahead. We've got got a few more minutes left on the call, so we've got some time. Or if you want to type in the chat, you're welcome to type in the chat as well, and we'll get to it that way. Yeah. What does everybody do? Does anybody just want to tell me what it is they do? I'd just like to know who we're talking to, what kind of businesses. Hello, this is Mia Earl. How are you all? Great. I have a uh, reflexology and wellness practice. Okay. So providing reflexology services, uh, wellness services, and then I offer um, herbal nutritional products. Okay. Is it brick and mortar? Or do you have an actual location? Yes. Yes, the my reflexology practice is brick and mortar. So, what do you are you getting any kind of breaks from your landlord, or has anything happened there, or what's what are you seeing out there? Uh, well, um, I guess I'm in a more fortunate situation in terms of my actual space, uh, because I've kind of paid for it. I've been there the last um, ten years, so I've kind of paid for that space. Uh, but the flip side of that is, of course, with reflexology, it's a, you know, touch, touch. Um, business, so just seeing the decrease in clients. Yeah, are they, are they scared to come in on a, or is it just they can't afford to come in or what do you know? Or do you even know that? Uh, I think for some of them, initially, it was the fear. Uh, even though I am a, you know, appointment by appointment for some, it was just a fear and then uh, abiding by the, um, you know, the stay at home orders, that sort of right. thing. Uh, majority of my business also was working with corporations. Therefore, I was going into corporations. And of course, many of them closed their doors to outside vendors. So you're a great example. What have you done to stay in business? Have you what? How have you been able to get any sales? If you have, uh, I still very very few clients. Some regular clients that would still come, uh, but I also rely more heavily on my online wellness uh, products as well. So that sustains some. Uh, 
uh, of course, did have, you know, some savings that, you know, helped, helped, helped a little bit. Um, so a, co a combination of that. But, but of course, it, it, it's a challenge. I understand. Yeah, but that's good. So I hope you're actually like a great example of a lot of stuff we talked about. I mean, you, you're getting hit on both sides. You, you People aren't coming to you and your other part about not being able to go out was a double whammy and then but luckily you did have some uh, second line of business to help sustain which is really important right absolutely well is you is it getting any better or is it coming back around any at all um not necessarily yet <laughs> okay, okay. I yeah. think for, for for corporate, it's going to take some time because they're still, you know, ironing out some things. A lot of the people are working from home. So for that, it's going to take a while for me with reflexology. And I've talked to Mr. Tag about this. It, it's going to be, you know, a whole different line of, of marketing and, and promotion uh, to get people to come into the office. Yeah, that's a challenge. I actually spoke to a person yesterday at a pretty big office here in town, big corporate office, and they're not saying this, but it's, it's kind of implied is there's a whole other issue they have there. And you're seeing this in schools. You're seeing this all across the board. The whole litigious society part of nobody wants to be first back full board because they're afraid they're going to get sued. So if you come in, if someone goes back, if you tell everybody, you got to all come back to the office, and then if somebody hires some guys, they're going to get sued. So it's a it's a matter of, um, that's a real concern if you have a lot of corporate clients because they're probably having to answer to headquarters, wherever that is. And headquarters has a legal team of 50 lawyers somewhere telling them not to go back to work. So all these challenges are real, and you just got to keep trying to find ways creative ways to get some sales somehow. Sorry. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. But anyway, I appreciate you speaking up and it's nice to hear. And I know it doesn't sound like it's going great yet again, but it's nice to hear what's going on. So kind of know what's happening out there. Right. Thank you. You got some, you got some other chat stuff. Anyone else would like to unmute themselves and talk to David as well. We did have a couple of people tell us what they do. We have uh, Gregory's Long Service uh, on the call and also Comprehensive Staffing Solutions, which is medical and industrial staffing. Man, I bet they've got some stories because, um, I don't know, I'd like to, are they still on the call? Um, I'm, not sh I'm not sure. Because I was wondering about that because I know some places were cutting back because they told nobody to come to the hospital at the beginning because my sister-in-law works at Baptist and then they were having, so it was like they were expecting all these people. They didn't get quite as many people, but then other people weren't coming because no, everybody was scared to go to the hospital thinking they would catch the virus. So there was a whole bunch of issues there around, uh, Actually, I'm lay off some people at different locations. So just didn't know what was going on in that world. That would have, that'd be interesting to hear. But on the uh, on the long service side, I don't think those guys ever stopped. They just kept on rolling. Hi, David. This is Terry Lawrence with Gregory's. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Uh, no, we have been uh, business has been pretty much booming for us. We also have a contract. Um, with the county and uh so we've been going pretty good uh what we did start doing this year was using um the cash app so that we wouldn't have to have any direct contact with with our clients so that's been working pretty good for us yeah that's good that's a good way to get you know creative you, you got to do what you got to do with the, um, the technology as well so because really you tell me my impression that is you that's really more to put the customer at ease. You guys need the money, right? But it put the customer at ease to say, I can keep on paying them contactless and I still get my service done. So it really enhanced your service capability. 
Yes, that's exactly um, what that's about. And it's been working really well for us. Good deal. Glad to hear it. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Did anybody, um, what do you got on the chat there, Taylor? Anything else? Well, not, nothing else in the chat, but I, we did, did bring up a good point that uh, that's a good question to ask yourself, too, is, is how can you make your customers feel more at ease with your right. products? Versus like the example, Mrs. Earl, she does a reflexology. That's direct, you know, direct touching of the body. You know, so some of the things she could think about are, you know, what can she do to make her customer feel more at ease that they're they're able to come in, whether it's providing the PPE or making a sterile work environment or whatever that is. And that's something you can ask in your business too, whatever it is, how can I make my customers feel more at ease? Yeah, and I even had to do that as a CPA this year because we have this client portal where people can download their stuff and I can prepare it and send it back to them and they can e-sign. And um, once again, I'm not the most savvy technical person, but I had a lot more people use that this year because they still won't come in. And so it was like, okay, they had a scanner at their house. They scanned all their stuff to me. And it was nice in some ways. It definitely is a change for me. So I took some getting used to because I usually have a handful do it. They don't live here. But this time it's people that literally live two blocks from my office, but they didn't want to come in. So I'm like, okay, I understand. So yeah, you know, that, that's great to Taylor's point. Anything you can do to make them uh, comfortable to still use your services or product is really something you got to go out of your way to do right now. But also with that, the accountant comes out and keep in mind, if you have to buy PPE, that's an expense. So it may be a, not a huge expense, but you may need to tell your customer, say, look, um, I'm having to pay. Some people gave hazard pay to their staff. So if you say, OK, if I got a lady or, or somebody at the front desk could be uh, um, whoever or you got a technician or whoever. Hey, I'm having to pay them another two dollars an hour hazard pay or whatever it is. And I'm having to buy this PPE. You need to build that into your pricing and say, look, I, I'm sorry, but I can't just absorb the expense forever. I have to pass that on. And that that kind of puts you, that's a little more challenging. I just said that real easily, but I know it's a challenge. So it's just something to think about, though, is when you have those additional costs, it is, yeah, it's great you keep the sales, but you also need to watch what all you're spending to keep those sales. So did, did anybody, I mean, I, I hope I helped you out today with some ideas or something useful. I hope you're able to take something away. Um, I like feedback, good or bad, either one. Just want to know uh, if there's anything that was useful to you um, or anything that reinforced something you were already thinking. That's always good, too, um, to hear that somebody else thinks the same way you do. Just wondering about that. Yeah, we've also, we've also, Greg Levy and Audrey Green, they they provide a catering service, which I'm sure they're they're having to find some creative ways to to uh, get going here as well. And, and yes, we will actually provide uh, copies of of the of the slide, not the slides, but the re, this replay will be available, and we'll email that out to you uh, when we've got it ready. Okay. And uh, yeah, any kind of do they give a feedback, Taylor? Or any kind yeah. of questionnaire or anything? Okay. Yeah, I just want to make sure there's something you got. Because a lot of times, even if, it's not, even if you didn't think, learn anything new, it's just nice to hear somebody reaffirming what you already think because it lets you know you're not the only one out there doing things that way. But um, I appreciate the opportunity you're talking about. I love, learn, I love small business. And I love hearing what's going on with them and how they're able to, you know, beat back adversity constantly but able to, you know, come out on the other side of it successful. And I think this is another case of it because I think people became aware of what's out there and now they're going to be able to turn it around, use it to their advantage and really springboard forward when things come back around to uh, whatever normal is. Well, we got a couple, we got a couple of minutes left and uh, uh, Greg Levy from Musical Chef that did, did put a comment in here that he's, Lost about sixty thousand dollars of revenue during t due to his cancels uh, clients canceling, and so what he's he's pivoted doing is reaching out to his existing uh, customers, even though that he offers dinner you know dinner for families now with delivery. 
So that that's that seemed to help him out in some way. So that's again another example of kind of thinking outside the box and getting creative with, with what you're doing. Exactly. I know that I would think the caterers got hammered pretty bad because large events went away. But that's you had so what it sounds to me like uh, Mr. Levy's having to do there is go out to scale down from feeding 500 to feeding five. It's a big difference, but it can. Uh, it's still the same product. I'm not, but you have to do a different scale, and that's something that uh, you know is good to see. That he's able to do that. I mean, that's that's encouraging. Well, we got a couple couple minutes left. Anybody else want to jump on and ask David a question? Uh, if feel free to do that. We just, as we wrap it up, we again thank you for for joining us on the webinar. We hope it's been helpful for you, and that uh, at least you got some information to go on that maybe will help you think a little bit differently in how you can you can uh, up level your business and increase your revenues and hopefully gain gain a few more customers. So again, we thank you. Thank you for joining. Thanks for the opportunity, Taylor.